So much love to my dad, man. I can't thank God enough for blessing me with this brother on this earth, man. A, a, a beautiful soul, a beautiful brother, a beautiful father, a great boxer, man. A decorated cop with no no flags on his jacket. People down North Philly love him. Everybody from Rashid Wallace to uh, Meek Mills did an interview, talked good about my dad, Jesse Hart. He's a great person, man. I love my dad to death, man. I wish him the best. And you know what I mean? Much love. Much love always, Dad. Officer Young, how you doing? Um, what I would like for you to do, I want you to tell me what you know about my friend, Tyrone Butterfly Crawley, boxer and Philadelphia policeman, and also a coach at the Police Athletic League. Take it away. Okay, um, I've known Officer Crawley, Tyrone Crawley, for about 25 years. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, and when I first came to the Police Athletic League, Tyrone was kind of a mentor for me. Uh, I watched how he took some of the hardest uh, kids that he dealt with. He would take, take a kid and turn them around. Um, a lot of kids he dealt with, uh, they went from being bad kids to good kids and productive kids. Um, nobody wanted to work at his power center. His power center was located at 23rd and Burks, and it was a hard neighborhood because growing up, that's where I grew up at. My grandmother lived right across the street from St. E's, which where the, that's where the uh, police athletic league, where Tyrone Crowley worked. So I would see Ty, and when I got into the department, he was one of the reasons why I wanted to get into the police athletic league. I saw what he did with the kids, how he was a positive impact on the whole neighborhood, and um, I just wanted to do it. And, it was one of my goals in life, and because of Ty, I'm in PAL. My name is uh, Officer Bill Schneider. Uh, I run the Tacony PAL Center. Uh, I'm also a big boxing fan and a friend of Tyrone Butterfly Crowley. Um, how it started for me with Tyrone Crowley was I was a boxing fan when I was younger and a huge boxing fan, and I worked the 22nd District as a police officer, and I heard about that Tyrone Crowley ran the PAL Center down there, and he was very well respected. Um, I got transferred to the Police Athletic League, and when I came here, I ended up getting to work with Tyrone as a new officer, and I start talk, we started talking boxing, and when he realized how much of a boxing fan I was, uh, we really kicked it off. And the thing about Tyrone was he's such a humble guy, and what he did with the kids down there and how much of a factor he was with the children and making a difference in that community, he's incredible. And you'll never, to hear Ty tell the stories, you really have to pull it out of him. And if you pull it out of him, he'll talk about it. Right. But um, he's one of my heroes, and I was fortunate enough to spend a number of years in the Police Athletic League with him. And, and fortunately, being his friend and seeing him get all the acknowledgments that he does and being the great guy he is. Ty, you're uh, one of my heroes, and uh, I can't thank you enough for what you've done for all the children of Philadelphia and what you've done for boxing and what a great guy and friend you are. Tyron was a real savvy, real, real smart fighter, you know. I think he was underestimated sometimes, but he got in there and he just gave it all he got, all he had when he got in that ring. You know, I knew him for a good while coming up. I knew his son, his son come up here and train. Um, nothing but good things to say about him, man. He's a hell of a person. Most, most of the fighters are like that, too. You know, we got good attitudes about things in life, you know. So I raised him, you know, with the top guys. Cool. I don't know if, if Crawley ever fought for me. Right. I don't think he did. 
but he was fighting for on ESPN a lot, and I remember when they made the fight with Robin Blake, Rockin' Robin Blake, the golden boy from Texas. Frank Sinatra fell in love with him. This TV guy fell in love with him. And they make this fight, and I'm thinking to myself, what do they think because it's in Texas? <laughs> Robin Blake is going to... I said, Tyrone Crawley is going to embarrass Robin Blake and ruin everything that Top Rank has done for Robin Blake. I mean, great for Tyrone Crowley, but it's, yeah. it's usually not the kind of mistake that Top Rank would make. That fight made Crowley, and that fight got him the title shot with Bramble, and I was really surprised that he didn't beat Bramble, because I thought he was a much... But Bramble was a tough egg, but I, I still thought that Crowley would lick him. But, you know, Crowley was a... He was a, head, he was a better fighter than some of the guys that are around. Hey, what's going on, America and the rest of the world? Xander J. Hobson here, stand-up comedian and entertainer, director and producer of documentaries. Welcome to another episode of The Remarks. Uh, we're going to do our latest documentary on Tyrone Butterfly Crawley. Crawley, a very accomplished boxer. And Ty was a great guy. And one of the things about Ty... He was a very intelligent fighter, very intelligent person, and a very shrewd operator. Tyrone walked away from the boxing game pretty accomplished. He made a nice amount of money for his time in boxing. Not the kind of money that Floyd Mayweather is generating, but still, for the 80s, Ty made a nice little mint. And not only was Tyrone a boxer, he had a game plan. He was a college-educated man. Tyrone was a paratrooper in the United States Army. And after his boxing career was over, Tyrone would become a Philadelphia policeman. And he would eventually make his way to the Police Athletic League, where he would mentor hundreds and hundreds of kids, maybe even thousands, in his nearly 30-year career as a policeman. So... Here it is, you have an individual who not only entertained folks in the boxing ring, he also stepped outside of the boxing ring and became a public servant as a policeman, and also he became a coach in the Police Athletic League in North Philadelphia and influenced the whole bunch of young people. Ty was like a big brother to me. I met Ty maybe back in 83 when I first went to the gym. We were both trained by William Smiley Hayward, a man who was like a father to both of us. <sighs> so I got to get ready to get uptown. I should have been out of this house maybe like about a half an hour ago. But I sat here and I said to myself I would only play one game of chess. And I end up playing maybe like about five games of chess. I know I'm going to be late. Ty's going to be complaining. Well, Maybe Ty believe I got stopped by a policeman. And I, that's what I'll tell Ty. I'll tell Ty I got stopped by the police and that's what held me up. Bam. Hi, how you doing? I'm Tyrone Butterfly Crawley, former professional boxer, ESPN lightweight champ, USBA lightweight champ. WBA number one contender, WBC number one contender, IBF number one contender. A four 15 round championship fight with Livingston Bramble, which was a good fight. And life goes on after that. I'm sitting here waiting on my buddy Chucky. He's supposed to be doing a documentary on me. Um, he's always late, so I'm just being patient with him. By the time he gets here, I'll have to cuss him out. Since I'm here still waiting on Chucky, he hasn't got here yet. You know, let me show you my game room, so follow me. This is my other love right here, pool. I love it, love pool. I love, enjoy it very much. 
And um, this is where I spent a lot of my time at, watching um, television, watching upcoming events. This is this is it right here. All right, I'm gonna show you guys how to play a little pool. This is what I do on my pastime right here. Um, I'm a pretty good pool player. So if there's anybody out there that want to challenge me, you know, just let, let us know. So let me go ahead and make a couple balls real quick. And, and I, I just run the table on you guys. That's what I'll probably do. Looking good, looking good. Here we go, final shot. We can get started. Let me see what it's chucky at anyway. Dang. Oh man, here he come right now. He's just pulling up. It's about time. Damn. Hey, you know what's crazy about this guy? Ever since he started this comedy and this filming, he's been calling himself Xander. His mom gave him the name Chucky. And that's what I'm going to call him. Oh, here he come right here. Here go, Chuck. It's about time. He's just pulling up. Come on, Yo, where, where you been, man? I've been out here like two hours, man, waiting on you. Two hours, man. I'm all right. I'm about 30 minutes late, man. I had to do something at the house, man. Well, I'm glad, well, I'm glad you're here, then. Let's do it, man. All right. Dang, Chuck. Same old Chuck, man. He was a little later, man. I would have body beat you. That's what I was thinking about back in the day. Shit, you couldn't take no body shots. Remember that? I don't want to talk about that, man. Same old champ. Always want to go to everybody's body, man. Go on, well, man. You Stop. Know, we gotta get this thing going, man. We are gonna get it together, champ. Come on, man. How did you get started in the manly art of fisticuffs? Well, I, was, I, I wanted to get into the gym probably when I was twelve. 12 years old, but my parents wouldn't let me go. Um, and I didn't really have any connection at the time to get to the gym. And at that time, there was gang on, so I couldn't go across town because they was afraid of me getting caught up in some kind of um, brawl or, or something. So I started when I was 15. I was old enough to, to get around. And, and, and that's once I went to the gym then, that's all she wrote. There's, there was a gentleman across that lived across the street from Joe Frazier on Ogons Avenue, the 6600. Uh, we call him Old Man Nick. And um, he used to pick us up, take us to the gym. The gym was you know, maybe like 10 miles away from where we live, up in um, the uh, Port Richmond section of the city uh, at a PAL center called Rizzo Pal is, is that's where I got started at. You mean the Rizzo Pal, sir, named after the uh, the late mayor and uh, controversial police commissioner whose statue they just now took around? You mean Frank Rizzo, sir? Is that who we talking about? That's who we talking about. Yo. Okay, okay, sir. Take it away from there. And at that time, um, that, was, that area is, you know, predominant white area. Um, it, it, was a, it was a good area. We never had no problems over there. And um and, and that's all she wrote. They were just glad to have boxes over there. Mm. They they treated us well. Um especially when you're a winner, you, you always get a good um good company. Everybody loves a winner, champ. You know how that is, man. Yeah. You were, I believe, a natural southpaw, but you switched fluently from South Paul to Orthodox. Well, he tried to switch me um, to off the Orthodox, which is right here. Um, but it was just a habit of me switching back and forth. 
and it was like a defense to me. Um, and, and once you have your opponent thinking um, or hesitating on doing something, you have an advantage because you already in position and already know that you're capable of fighting from each side. So I feel like that was an advantage that I always had. And it just stuck with me from the time I stepped into the gym until the time I retired. No one was never able to switch me back uh, off of dogs. Um, so it was in my advantage. And also I had good hand speed and a, and a good mindset of, of fighting. You had blinded hand speed, sir, if I may say so myself. And you had a beautiful defensive acumen. I remember you being able to actually roll with punches to minimize the damage or the effect of a punch or to make a person miss all together. I mean, you had a beautiful style, style champ. I, this is this is the Ch Tyrone Butterfly Crawley that I remember. Defense was, was very important. Um, you know, I had the speed, I had the defense. One thing I didn't have, I wasn't a knockout puncher. Right. So I had to have uh, other things to... to to, to help me win, to um, put into my defense, or to put into to my um, way of fighting. Um, as I said earlier, it, it throws a lot of fighter off, especially if, if you can master it, where it, it'd be to your advantage. It always outpointed somebody. I know I'm going to outpoint you, and if I, if, if I get a stoppage, that's more power to myself. Man, I'm the art, and great power. Oh, when I moved to West Oak Lane, I was like 14 years old. I moved on Tyrone's block, and eventually, eventually when school started, you know what I mean, I got to mingling with them guys a little bit. Tyrone was one of them. And out of all the guys in the neighborhood, me and Ty became the tightest. We became the closest, him and I. Right. We used to, you know, when I used to go down to his house or whatever, and, uh, I had a mini bike in the garage, man, and you know I liked mini bikes at the time, but I didn't have one. But he did, so we right. would ride bikes and mini bikes, and he had these weights in his garage. He was really, you know these little, little weights you know, with the plastic weights with the, with the cement in them or whatever. Right, there was no real iron weights, up, but it was a good weight. And at the time, man, that joke was strong, man. I couldn't lift them weights. He was pumping them weights, man. 14, 15 years old, he was pumping them weights then. And, Ty was so bad that, you know, he was my boy. Everybody knew he was my boy. Right. Wouldn't nobody, wouldn't nobody mess with me. They right. wouldn't mess with me because they were scared of Ty. Right, they right. They knew I was Ty's boy, you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. So, 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 so Ty got to a fight in high school with one of these boys from Somerville. You know, them guys thought they was bad. Right. Ty beat the boy up in the bathroom <laughs> and took his hat. And okay. then wore his hat around school the rest of the day. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We got, sometimes you got to do that, funny. man. Then, yeah. And then, you know, we went to school, we, you know, we hung out in school a lot, and then when we got to high school, you know, we were good friends by then, man. Me and Ty, we, 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 we used to, you know, party together on the weekend, come prime time, man, when it was time for the senior prime, Ty was a year older than me. Right. Well, I took him down on South Street, and he bought these blue suede ballets. Right. You go with his suit. That he was wearing on a prom. Right. They matched, I mean, if you see his prom picture, they matched that thing perfect. Okay. But those shoes was for me. Right. But see, him being my boy, I let him go in and get him. You know what I'm saying? And right. back then, you wasn't going to cop what your boy got. No, no. What so, we, and to yeah. this day, I wish I had those shoes. Right, to this right. Day, that's how right. nice they were. Champ, when did you have your first fight? How many amateur fights did you have? And who did you fight and compete against in the amateurs? Well, I probably had around uh, 50 to 60 amateur fights. So I really never, I lost count. Um, I fought some of the top-notch fighters in, in the United States during my time. Um, I my One of my biggest fights was probably... Um, Johnny Bumpus. Wait a minute. You mean Johnny Bump City Bumpus, the former... He was he was one of the most accomplished amateurs at that time in the 1980s. I believe he was slated for the U.S. Olympic team, but owing to the boycott, he didn't compete. And Johnny, you mean the same Johnny Bumpers who would go on to win the junior welterweight title? And you mean the same Johnny Bumpers that lost 
to Gene Mad Dog Hatcher, a fighter that you yourself beat, sir? Is this the but Johnny Buffers that we're talking about? Right, I had a fight with him in um, in Kentucky. I was in the military at the time, and they claim they don't remember the fight, but I always will remember it. Ah. Ah. And the, the next one probably will be. Robert Bam Bam Hines. Oh, wait, you mean, hold up. You mean Robert Hines, the former world junior middleweight champion? Correct. My goodness, and we were all at the same gym at one, yeah. once upon a time. Oh, no, that was my buddy. Right. We just happened to meet in the tournament. Right. And um, and at that time, I just got out the service, and I knew that I was capable of having a, a successful uh, professional boxing career. After um, beating um, Robert Hines right. and working out with some of the best Philadelphia fighters that was available in in the city at that time, right? Anthony Two Gun Fletcher, Kenny Twine, um, Tyrone Artis, um, Dennis Howard, Kevin Howard. These guys I, I, I worked out with. I mean, actually get in the ring and, and spar, and sometimes. You know, the sparring match has become uh, rough, really rough. That's just the way the Philly fighters was. Right. We Once we step into that box, that square inside the ring, it becomes uh, a battle. Mm. I'm not going to say a fight, but it's a battle. Right. And um, and once I was, knew I was able to handle the top-notch fighters, then all fighters that's world rank, you know, I might as well turn pro. And, and give it a try and say, okay, let me see how far I can go. Okay. Yeah, so me and Tony, we go back to uh, 1970 when I moved to Philadelphia yeah. and moved on, on Kinsdale Street. So we've been friends since I was in the sixth grade and he was in the seventh. And uh, our neighborhood was very competitive. So we, you know, we played all kinds of sports, half ball, stick ball, organized sports. And that was our thing. And and um, and we were, you know, all very competitive together. Right. And Ty was a, a good athlete, very good athlete. Okay. And almost all sports that he that he that he played. And uh, his attitude has always been: you, you basically got to prove to me that I that you can beat me. So right, whatever, right. Whatever that may be, you know, he's going to say, "Okay, I can do it. I can. I take you on, and, and you got to beat me." And, and you proved it to me, so that's, right. that's the kind of person he, he was. Uh, we re remained friends uh, over all these years, except you know, for the last forty-eight years, we've been we've been friends. I we were we both went in the, in the military after high school, and um, I was overseas a couple of years, and you know, he was in Fort Bragg primarily, um, I, you know, boxing and, and doing uh, some. He was a he was an infantry yes airborne and uh, he started he continued boxing when he was he was there so I kind of followed his career there when I whenever I could um, uh, then you know when he turned professional I was I was in California um, a lot of a lot of years after I got out of the military and I would uh, kind of catch it on ESPN if it was on uh, whatever channel it was I I did get to go see. Uh, you know, he fought Brambleton for the championship. I was there, you know, cheering him on. And then when I moved back from California back to uh, the East Coast, moved to, to, right. um, to Northern Virginia, you know, we, and then we was able to see each other more when I, as I would come up to Philly or, or you know, he would come down that way. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's what it's been. We, you know, over the years, we've just been, you know, real good friends. He's, he's a person that's thoughtful. Uh, a guy with a lot of heart. Heart of a lion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that that again, you got you, you got to prove it to him. Right. That you that baby can't do it. So yep, we've been you know real good friends for all that you know all those years. We've right, played, right, right. Said all the sports, all the games from the little electric football to electric whatever it was. If it was a sport, we played it. So, right, right, right. Yeah. Sir, I heard you say not too long ago not to change the subject. But I think I heard you say that you were a soldier, sir. And um, I don't, I don't, I don't want to insult a fellow serviceman. I don't want to do that, sir. But, but you soldiers are. I think you guys 
I don't know what to say about you, sir. And I don't know what to say about you, soldier. So if, if I can't say anything nice, I'm not going to say anything at all, sir. But, sir, what I what I need you to do is just I want you to reflect on your life as a as 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 a soldier, sir. I want you to tell me were you a member of the U.S. Army boxing team? What was your job? I believe, sir, that you jumped out of airplanes. I don't understand why anyone in their right mind, sir, would jump out of a perfectly good aircraft. I know myself because I was the guy that used to send you guys out the airplanes. But, sir, I need you to momentarily and briefly reflect on your career as a member of United States Armed Services and also what your job was when you were a member of United States Armed Services. Sir, take it away. Went to the service um, probably three or four months after graduating from school. Um, got caught up in some trouble in between that time, four months. And, and, and I had no choice but to, to get out the neighborhood and do something positive with myself. And I decided to enter the Army. Um, Why not the Marines, sir? Why not the Air Force, sir? I'm just curious. Well, at that time, I just wanted to get away. So I didn't really have any time to, to, to pick or to choose in between, you know, which one I would go to. So I just selected the Army. And I went, I think it was October of 76 and got out October of um, 79. I wound up in Fort Dix, New Jersey for basic training, which isn't far from here. And then I wound up for my AIT in Virginia, um, St. Petersburg, right outside of Richmond uh, for school. I was uh, in the medical field um, as a clerk. And then I wound up in uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, um, paratrooper. I signed up for paratroop school while I was at AIT in Virginia. Um, I signed up to jump out of the airplanes because they wanted to send me to Germany. And I said, how can I get out of this um, order to go to Germany? So the, the guy that was uh, rec recruiting people told me, if you go to jump school, mm. I said, jump school? I acted stupid. I, I knew what was jump school. My dad was a paratrooper. So what's jump school? He said, a paratrooper. But down there in Georgia. Columbus, Georgia. I said, okay, sign me up. You know, I was a, 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 a student in Virginia in school. I was the platoon leader in basic training. I get down to jump school, I'm the platoon leader. So it must have been on my records that I could handle the, handle the young man that was there because I was the platoon leader. So I had to keep everything in order. Um, always um, gets down there Fort, Fort Benny, Georgia outrun everybody outdo everybody in the physical department um, it, it was everything was going in my favor mm. next thing I know we jump school start we're jumping out of airplanes perfectly good airplanes <laughs> and, and the first one first my first jump I had a, I was a little, little afraid um, the first time, but I, I always liked doing um, dangerous things. I was always kind of rough, and, and so I really kind of started enjoying it. Mm. You know, the challenge. Yeah, it was, it was a comical. The first couple jumps was comical because while you're in the air, you're seeing guys on the ground getting dragged through the parachute because of the wind is blowing them. Mm. Once that once that air get in your chute and you don't know how to, to close it up, you're going to get drugged maybe a half a mile <laughs> or something until until you, you get you're tired of being dragged and, and do do what you got to do to, to stop yourself from being, being hurt. Mm. Um, you know, everybody go through it but it, it, was, it was fun. Um, so I wound up with maybe 35 jumps throughout my career. So I was at Fort Brad, and that's where I they happened to join the All Army Boxing Team. I went over there a week after getting down 
for Brad. I had I had a few of my stuff, but I, I was in no kind of shape. I gets over there, the all army coach thought I was talking BS. You know, like a, a kid that just come off of the street think he could fight. He put me in the ring with the all army champ. We sparred three rounds. The first two rounds was close. I was able to hold my own on him. I, I felt like I was getting an advantage over him and he probably felt the same way, but it was close. The third round, I was tired. So he got the advantage you know, over me that round. Come that following week, while I was at my um, permanent base, I get a call and say, you have now been transferred. I said, okay. And, and I smiled and laughed. I said, okay, they, they like me. And that's, that was the, the other part of my amateur career. And, and, and doing so well down there, I said, when I get home, I was gonna turn pro. What gym did you train out of after being released from the Army and just before turning pro? Down North Philly, between um, Cecil B. Moore and Ridge Avenue. Oh, we talking about the Champs Gym at the Champs Gym. Oh, correct. okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, went down there and, and, and got hooked up with a gentleman named Smiley, Billy Hayward, who, who wound up being my trainer, uh, being like a father figure to me, uh, being a friend. So we call him Smiley, a good guy. Mm -hmm. And um, and Smiley recognized something. You know, we um, he, he, he used to say, "I knew you were special when you came into the gym." Mm -hmm. um, so we used to laugh about it. And during the years, you know, uh, Smiley was my my main guy. I wouldn't I wouldn't treat him in the world um, for any trainer. And he said, we're going to take this all the way. And damn it, we didn't. We, you know, we took it to the, to the championship. Mm. You know, I won two belts, two other belts. And, uh, but, you know, we took it to the third belt, the world world championship belt, and, and couldn't ask for more. Couldn't ask for no more. <laughs> provide any input on Tyrone Crawley as a fighter? As a fighter, very talented fighter. Um, Tyrone actually worked with me a lot when I was an amateur and then and later on as a professional. It really helped me a lot. Very, very uh, smooth, smooth, just a smooth guy. Smooth, everything about Ty Tyrone is just smooth. His personality, everything. Just a, just a unbelievable or a person to be around. I, you know, I really enjoyed it. We're doing a documentary mm -hmm. on uh, Tyrone the Butterfly Crawler. And uh, you've seen Tyrone Crawley in the past. I know you worked with Smiley. Y'all seen you guys together when you worked Prince Charles Williams' corner. What are some of your opinions and points of views on Tyrone the Butterfly Crawley, sir? You know what? Tyrone was a great fighter, good boxer, but not a devastating punch and in my opinion he just didn't have the staying power to outlast the snake man he had the snake man beat for eight miles on, on points because he was right. boxing brilliantly right you don't watch the fight he was boxing brilliantly right, right. i just i just think the kid was much bigger right because i i want to say at that that, that particular night i, I want to say tyrone was no more than about 48 yeah. I won't even say he was 50 yeah. the night of the fight. Right, but, right. But, but his team had him ready, just that. He had a bigger guy in him, and, 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 and just the timing just wasn't there. Right, but, right. You, but you gotta look at it, as you just said, but how it was only two world champions. Right, right. But to get to them two, you must have to fight 20 world champions to get to them. You had to fight a bunch of killers, and it's a fact. Crawley defeated uh, world champion uh, Gene Mad Dog Hatchet, uh, also world champion um, 
Charlie Choo Choo Brown. Remember when he won the USBA title? Yeah. Matter of fact, he took the he took a fight against Charlie Choo Choo Brown for a tune up and a fight for Bramble. How many guys you know would fight a killer like Charlie Brown as a tune up fight? You know, when they made that fight, I thought I said if Russell didn't put him in the cross, if the Russell had Choo Choo Brown was ready. Right. And, and Al Mitchell. Right. Right. So, so, and not only that, to give talent just do. I lost money when he went there. Because nowhere in the world, I'm in Vegas, I thought he would beat Robin Robin Blake in Texas. Right. Nowhere in the world. I right. must have lost about, about four or five hundred at the casino. Nowhere right. in the world I thought he was going into Wait Texas. Wait a minute, Leon. Like, you from Philadelphia, man, and you betting against Tyrone I'm, I'm I'm a, a, Wait a minute, Leon. I'm going to tell you what I said. It ain't personal, it's business. He going into that neighborhood, the Long right. Tall State. Right, right. We ain't in Atlanta City, Philadelphia, New York. I got you, Leon. I so, got you. It's you. business. I got you. I, I took a you. shot and came up shot. What can you tell me about this fella, Tyrone the Butterfly Crawley, sir? Ah, uh, well, man, we grew up together. We've been lifelong friends. Um, I tell you, it's tough little brother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Always been tough. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and um, came from a tough family. Okay. You know, his father was a former police officer. Okay. You know. Yep, and um, you know uh, we we were urbanized in Philadelphia, you know, and uh, we we both had big brothers, and our big brothers had reputations that we had to live up to, you know. But um, yeah, he's a good brother, positive brother, uh, wasn't afraid of nothing. I take it that you followed his boxing career. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep, from the very beginning. Okay. You no, know, we start we started off together at the PAL. Cool. Uh, in Philadelphia, Rizzo PAL. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah, under the tutelage of an older gentleman named Nick. I don't recall his last name, but everybody called him Nick. He taught us how to box. We were in eleventh grade, going to the twelfth grade uh, when this was taking place. You know, mm. and uh, got to see some incredible um, talented guys. You know, during that time, and um, Ty, he grew into his. You know, uh, he went away to the service and uh, joined the box, the um, uh, USA boxing team. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And um, he put some pretty, uh, pretty good guys, tough guys. You know, and I think that's how he he kind of started honing his skills. But you got to have a certain kind of heart, you know, and um, he was. He was tough. He had that heart, you know. Sir, what we want to hear, we want to hear about some of your uh, trials as a uh, contender. Now, en route to your showdown with uh, World Boxing Association lightweight champion Livingstone Bramble. It was, it was fun. Um, just to find yourself in the ring with guys that you read about that live in different parts of the country. Um, guys that I know that's able to hold their own, watching them on TV or watching them on tapes, um, knowing about them, even knowing them through the amateurs. Um, it was it, it was it was a hell of an experience. Boxing is is a deep game. Um, it's, it's, it's brutal. Um, you get paid, you get you know, you get a good payday, but you got to get up there in that bracket to, to get uh, a decent payday. Um, you don't want to be an opponent; you, you want to win. And for you to win, you must stay in the gym, um, do your do your road work. Because um, normally, when you do your road work, ninety five percent of the time you you're running by yourself. Um, so. It's all on you. That's to give you good stamina. I know I, I go deep until the tenth round of the majority of my fights. I know I got to be in good shape. And if my opponent get tired on me, I knew when when they got tired. You could see your opponent because you're in the ring with them. And once they start getting winded, that's when you, you turn it on and start taking advantage of them. And by me having good feet movement, good feet, feet speed. Hand speed, uh, good defense. You know, it became easy. Not easy, but easier. Mm -hmm. 
for for me to win fights. Um, it, it's a dangerous sport. Um, getting hit is a no joke. Um, this kid named Al Earthquake Carter that I fought for the ESPN lightweight title. Al Earthquake Carter. I remember that guy. 25 professional fights. And here I go. Step in the ring with, with um, eight pro fights. <laughs> you know, I, eight pro fights. So I had a little, a little scared in me at, the, at that time. Um. Cause I, I felt like he knocked out 24 people and I'm about to get into the ring with him um, to, for this championship fight. So that was very interesting for me. But I knew after the first round with him, I, I stood there on purpose for two rounds, for maybe two to three rounds to hold my grounds to let him know that, you know, you in the ring with somebody that can really fight. I'm not afraid of you, sir. I dropped him in the second round. Right. I heard him in the third round. And from there on, I had the advantage because he knew what I was capable of doing to him. Once I won that fight, I knew I was coming for the big guys. And, and the big guys at that time was Boom Boom Mancini, Hector Camacho, um, Livingston Bramble, Anthony Two Gun Fletcher, who was a friend of mine from Southwest Philly. Tyrone Artis. Um, the great Gary the Executioner Hinton, sir. Gary Hinton was a junior welterweight at the time, but Gary and I used to get we used to spar together quite a bit because he was Southpaw. Charlie Choo Choo Brown. Charlie sir. Choo Choo Brown. We used to spar together. Two of the toughest guys. And that weight class back during that time, sir, was Gene Mad Dog Hatcher, and the other one was Rockin' Robin Blake, sir. You beat both of them handily, sir. What was it? What were these guys like, sir? Tell, give it to me, sir. Gene, Gene, Gene was tough. Gene Hatcher was tough. Um, he was a body beater. If if he wear if he wear your body down. You, you get tired. It's like what he did to Buffus, sir, when he won the right. title. He knocked Buffus' goddamn head off Gene Hatcher, and, a man and, losing and, the entire fight until he landed that brutal shot that put Buffus' lights out, sir. And Gene was one of the guys that he's in shape. If you're not in shape, you're in trouble. Um, Gene's going to crowd you, throw punches at your body, um, hit you whatever way he can, forward, backwards. Um, I give him a lot of credit. Um, I fought him on my 10th pro fight, and that was on national television. My first national television fight um, on, on one of the big channels, which was on CBS at the time. I've been on ESPN probably two times, two to three times before that. Um, Gene was tough, and Rockin' Robin Blake was one of the guys that was about to fight for the world championship title. Against handsome, the, think against handsome Harry O'Royal, sir. Yeah. Harry O'Royal or, or Mancini. He had he had either one of them locked in. Um But you did, you took that you you disrupted so, that title shot, sir. When he when he when he when he stepped in there with you, sir, he was looking for easy night. And if I if I if I remember correctly, sir. You were the one that knocked him out of title contention. Am I right by saying this? Yeah, you're right. That was that was just a bad call on his people that was promoting him, made the decisions for him to, to put me in the ring with him at that time. And I was hungry because I lost a fight that I shouldn't have lost. To Melvin, Melvin Paul. the Tank Paul, sir. Yeah, the Melvin fight. I should not have lost that fight. I, I did it by playing around in the ring, being big headed, doing things that I normally don't do. Um, so that was a learning experience. To tell you the truth, that was that was helpful, mm. very helpful um, for me after losing that fight to Melvin Paul. That that fight helped me out the rest of my career, boxing career. Never never to underestimate nobody. Your next. Uh the next person that you uh, faced 
for a championship. You guys were bitter rivals. Tell me, champ, about your fight against Charlie Choo Choo Brown. Oh, well, it was uh, very, very interesting because we both was from the city of Philadelphia. We both trained in North Philly. We we probably trained maybe five or six blocks away from each other. And um, we worked out a few times. Um, he had come around to the 23rd Pal Gym. I would go around to the recreation center where he was training at. Um, it was a big fight at that time because both of us was world ranked. Charlie was also had a, a IBF championship title at one time. I myself had the ESPN lightweight title. So we was fighting for the USBA lightweight title and we both was world ranked at the time. So one of us had to go. I really felt like I had the advantage of him because um, because of my style. You know, they said I, I, I wasn't a hard puncher. I didn't even care about that. I had plenty of t intelligence. I knew how to box. I can move and I'm in condition. So that's what got over a lot on my, on my fights. Because a lot of fighters just didn't train as hard as I did. You know, getting up in the morning, running, you know, making sure you're at the gym on time, putting that, putting that extra effort in. And that's what I did. Um, I knew Charlie could punch, but I just knew I was in better shape. He surprised me of, of going 12 rounds. He got weak somewhere around the eighth, eighth round. I, I started to feel it. And, um, and that's when I think I, I took more advantage of him than where I stood more toe to toe. But I, I had to stay toe to toe the early part of the fight. We slugged it out the first three rounds. And, and it's not usually myself type of fight. Um, the announcers and, and fight fans and everybody was surprised of, of, of how I fought Charlie the first three or four rounds. I just had to um, let them know that I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here for this whole 12 rounds. If, if it takes 12 rounds, I will be there for the 12th round. That's a fight I don't like to talk about, Tabitha. I was emotionally invested in the fight because, again, you were my friend. I want you to talk about Livingston Bramble, leading up to Livingston Bramble, and everything that transpired, what that fight was like. Take it away. Well, that's what I was in the game for, to, to reach um, a world title fight, to go as high as I can um, in boxing. And I, and I got there. I, I set that set my goal to to be the best that I could be, and, and I had all the talent in the world. It was just being in condition. That fight right there was a was a good fight. Bramble won that fight that 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 day. He hit me with something uh, that I didn't see, and it caught me off guard. And he had advantage throughout the rest of the fight, and. Um, that was when I lost. Mm. You, I mean, you win some, you lose some. And, and, and that one I lost. Thankfully, Rodney Moore came came back and redeemed Philadelphia and straightened Bramble out, as did Fearless Fred Pendleton, so he didn't get away with it. You know, he was dealt with sternly. After uh, your boxing career, you um, you chose a career in law enforcement. And from um, once you got into the Philadelphia Police Department, you became um, a Powell's police officer. You moved to the to the PAL department. Can you tell the audience what made you choose law enforcement? I know you did have an uncle who I ran across. Old Walt Crawley, um, although I didn't know him Love through you, you <laughs> but tell it, tell everyone you know about the police department and becoming a Powell's police officer, taking over the Twenty Third Powell, which was a gym that I trained out of, which was operated by Philip Allen. The time I start 
prepare myself for retirement. Um, police department was something I wanted to do as a youngster. My dad, my uncles, was, was former Philadelphia cops. So I was gonna follow their footsteps. Um, I took criminal justice up in college for two years. And, but I still was boxing at that time, so I was juggling both school boxing, school boxing, and I, and I developed some friends down there in, in college, Philadelphia Community College at the time, um, and they was my fans on my first two professional fights, which was down in, in Philadelphia at the Mother's King Arena at the time, and um, law enforcement was always there because that was something I was going to prepare myself to, to do in life. Um, that was going to be my um, job after the boxing was over. Boxing was a temporary thing. Um, it just happened to blow up. I knew it was going to blow up because it was, it was in me. Um, I was telling people I'm not getting into this game just to get hit or just to get punched on or to be a opponent for somebody. Um, it was just something I was gifted with and I wanted to see how far it could go. Once I got to the to Philadelphia Police Force, uh, I, I already was known. You know, who, who didn't know anything about boxing? I was in the paper all the time. I was um, on television quite a few times. Um, so the Philadelphia Police Department, they took care of me um, and they asked me if I wanted to go and work with the, the youngsters. That wasn't something that, uh, that was planned. Um, and I said I will give it a try. And once I gave it a try, I, I loved it. The, uh, the Police Athletic League in, in the Philadelphia um, District especially in the North Philadelphia district where I trained at, where I knew that was a rough area, put me there. That's, you know, that was it. They asked me how I would feel if I get transferred down there. I, I said, I would love it. I met, met a lot of people down there. I, met, I, I taught a lot of kids. I kind of raised a lot of kids down there. I was their mentor. I was their father figures. Um, I was their friend um, to this day. Um, I'm still mentioned down there, and, and I, I love it. Could, couldn't have been a better uh, job for me once I got off of the street. I'm on the phone with uh, Fred Jenkins, legendary boxing trainer and uh, director of the ABC Gym. Hey, Mr. Jenkins, how you doing today, sir? Doing good. Back in the day, sir, you had one of the top lightweights in the city. In fact, you guided this man to the IBF uh, lightweight championship. But before your championship fight, you had another championship fight with a fellow by the name of Tyrone Butterfly Crawley. Sir, give me your estimation of Tyrone Crawley, and if you don't mind, can you tell me what it was like in that corner when you were working against Tyrone Crawley when you guys fought for the USBA lightweight championship, sir? Well, I thought, I thought we actually won the fight, but they didn't give it to us. <laughs> it, was, it, was a of, it was a lot of stuff in the game. If you're on the political side of it, there's always going to be a conflict with the judges. Right, right, you know, right. Everybody say the game ain't rigged, but from, from my experience, the game is rigged. Right, 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 right. Any, um, you have any comments on Tyrone Crawley as a fighter, sir? He's a great fighter. He, he, it wasn't that he uh, was a weak fighter. He was a good fighter. Mm. Very classic fight, classic fighter. The Philadelphia style wise. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, for years and years, you were a, a, a renowned boxing trainer. And after Tyrone Butterfly Crawley ended his boxing career, he made a transition from the um, boxing ring 
to the Philadelphia Police Department and later to the 23rd Police Athletic League, where he would take over the mantle from Philip Allen as North Philadelphia's coach. Uh, you were one of North Philadelphia's coaches. Phil Allen was one of North Philadelphia's coaches. And Tyrone Butterfly Crawley was one of North Philadelphia's coaches. Can you give me your input on Tyrone Crawley as a coach in the neighborhood, but also as a boxing trainer when he trained his son? Yeah, he was a pretty, pretty good listener. Uh, he had a lot of uh, skills. Uh, he was a very good and important coaches surrounding him that sometimes uh, it was easy for most Philadelphia fighters to become coaches because you had a, a whole gang of great coaches in Philadelphia. And basically everywhere you, every gym you went in, there was a coach, one or two coaches that stood out. That, you know, Philadelphia had so many great fighters. That's why half of the world come to Philadelphia for work right now. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia boxing skills is not just in Philadelphia now. It's scattered all over the world. Right. A great story Ty told me was he was down Atlantic City and Mike Tyson came up to Ty and, and was like so impressed that after boxing Ty was a police officer for 28 years and the fact that he was helping kids and, and Ty came back he's like I have something from an old friend and it was an index card signed by Mike Tyson. It just goes to show you the kind of guy Ty is and what kind of person he is. Listen, man, you know I got a lot of calls, man. That you got a thousand names. What is your name? Hob, Joe, Xander, Zulu? <laughs> Who you with? Don't get caught, Michael, somebody? No, no, let me... Yeah, you, explain this to me, because I got to justify that the people see this, man. All right, let me, all right, let me clear this up. The government, I can say the government because nobody's looking for me. The name is Joe Alexander Hobson. Joe was my first name. Alexander is my middle name. The streets call me Chucky for whatever the reason. That's what they call me. They call me Chucky. That's my nickname. Where it came from, I have absolutely no idea. Okay? In the professional setting, I was either Joel or Joe when I drove tractor trailers. Chuck Hobson when I fought. Once I retired from the Air Force back in 04, mm -hmm. and um, at some point, man, I started going through a midlife crisis, man. We all and um, I decided I wanted to be a, a, an entertainer, a comedian. And I said, okay, I could be Joe Hobson on stage. I could be Chuck Hobson. I could be Joe. Then I thought, I said, damn, you know what? I never used my middle name in my life. I never used the name Alexander. Right. And then I'm thinking, I said, well, I don't think I want to be Alexander Hobson, but Xander. That's a cool ass name, Xander. Yeah, it so, works. You, yeah, you yeah. got the Xander bar, got the Xander drink. Right, know, right. So that's, yeah, so, yeah. so that's so that's so that's pretty much the. Uh, yeah, because my girl was wonderful. It, what your name was, man? Right. My right. girl, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Oh,
say bam. Bam. There you go.